genuinely curious and confused. Why are guitar players and the guitar industry obsessed with copying someone else's sound? Well, I'll tell you, big guy, but you're probably not gonna like it. If you're new here, I make videos about creative tools and guitar gear. Listen, I'm not here to make enemies. I'm not gonna reveal who wrote that scary stuff on their Instagram story, but my God, I have never been so driven to disagree with someone. And I'm a pretty nice guy, I'm Canadian. I think it's a pretty snooty thing to say. Could you imagine you sit down to write a song, but you have to ignore everything you've ever learned from someone else? It's impossible. Like I discussed in my last video, you need prompts, you need a structure to work from. It's like software. They don't rewrite the code from the ground up with every update. Every version of Windows has a little bit of 3.11 in there. Everything we know about music, from the songs we write to the gear we love, is either consciously or subconsciously iterated on established concepts, i.e. copying other people. And looking specifically at musical gear, we look at what others use to learn how to select the tools to craft our own sound. All of your heroes have thousands of hours into their craft, whether they're touring, playing every single night, or in the studio. If you look at it logically, there has to be some objective reasons they chose their particular combination of gear, and taking concepts from their gear choices teaches you how to build your own tones. Also, give me a break. It's pretty hard to avoid copying someone's sound when guitar culture decided nearly every guitar and every amp design was perfect 60 years ago. So how did copying people help me with my gear choices? Man, I look back really fondly on the artists that I copied. It's how I became who I am today as a guitar player. So the big first one was Metallica. Yeah. They taught me that if you're gonna use lots of gain, you need to kind of like plan your rig around it. You need to have noise gates, you need to have humbuckers. Actually, it's kind of funny. I got talked into buying an all single coil strap for my first guitar, and immediately I was like, oh man, I need humbuckers to do what I want to do. Especially because my first pedal was this bad boy. Yeah. Now naturally, after the Metallica phase, I hit the phase that I think almost every guitar player hits. The Rage Against the Machine phase. I had the hot rails in the bridge. I had the kill switch in my guitar. And it really took me down the deep end of modding my guitar. That poor Strat has so many extra holes in it. And then as I started to get better as a guitar player, I hit the shred phase. I was the Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Paul Gilbert fan. It got me into Ibanez guitars, which I still love today because they're super high quality instruments. And if you're playing at that level, you need something that's very, very high quality and kind of tailored towards the play style that those guys do. And then as I started to reach the peak of my ability, or rather my willingness to practice that much to get that good, I hit the David Gilmore phase. Watching David Gilmore play during my shred phase really taught me to slow things down and be able to sing the solo you're trying to play. And even if you're not a big fan of David Gilmore and Pink Floyd, there are a lot of concepts to learn from David Gilmore's rig. So I bought all of it. 
Well, most of it is. Some of the stuff he has is really expensive and rare. I'm not rich. Until I got this high watt, I had never played a high watt. They're pretty rare in Canada and therefore very expensive. And I was looking for an amp that could serve as like a bed for my pedals. But I've always found that the typical Fender amp sounded a little bit boxy. And to me, they don't sound big in the room. And I wouldn't have took the plunge on a high watt had I not been steered that way from David Gilmore. Gilmore is a prolific get gain with pedals guy, and he has a huge tone, and he's used high watt basically his entire career. There has to be merit to that choice. Going with high watt taught me about clean headroom and what it took for if I wanted a clean tone that sounds big, that's big wattage, big iron, pushing lots of air, and that means big tone. I have a video plan talking about the crazy story of how I got this high watt. I didn't pay a lot of money for it, that's for sure. Look, I could talk until I'm blue in the face about the huge, glorious rig that David Gilmore uses. The key takeaway though is his touring setup can appear big, but the effects he's using are all pretty normal off the shelf pedals. I've built this little pedal board here with the basics of the types of pedals David uses. I don't know if I should refer to him as his first name. We're not friends, but I wish we were. There's a couple things he does that I've taken with me, and one of the big ones is gain staging and stacking. He almost always runs his fuzzes into an overdrive, and doing that uses the EQ of the drive to shape that raw fuzz tone as a way to control it. This was like an aha moment for fuzz for me, and made me a believer in the glory of a fuzz pedal. He also stacks delay pedals, which lets them bounce into each other, which is, in my opinion, one of the most fun tones you can get with a guitar. A great example of this is Run Like Hell, Wicked Song. In the early days, he would do this with multiple Binson Echo Rec units. Then he moved on to digital delays to be able to set a precise delay time. In this case, I like the SDE 3000D here because it's two delays in one, so I can do the bounce thing with one pedal. things I learned not to do from David Gilmore is running modulation pedals after distortion, which is a literal crime. 99% of modulation pedals need to go before distortion, and you can fight me on that. Good fights. <sighs> now for guitars, I didn't learn a whole lot from old Davy G. Gilmore usually plays strats that are generally pretty normal. I did learn, however, the neck on mod from him, and it's a must do mod for most of my strats. One facet of David Gilmore's guitars that always intrigued me is his use of EMG pickups from the 80s onward. Back in my Metallica phase I was talking about, I had a great interest in EMGs because they used them too. But as I progressed in my guitar journey, I started to hear people poo-poo them. See people say they're sterile, they're compressed. But there's something inside me that always wanted to give David Gilmore's pickup set a try. Because after all, if it's good enough for a prolific gear god to use them for decades, a guy who can literally use anything he wants, surely they aren't bad. 
And I did a video recently about this guitar and how I got it and how I look at the mods for it. And because it was candy apple red, I couldn't resist. And I actually like them a lot. Life is too short to have 400 strats that all sound the same, and this one just hits different with these EMGs. One of the reasons I was interested in putting EMGs into a guitar is I'm hooked on direct sounds, direct to PA. I've seen so many prolific 80s player use them straight into a mixing desk, just like David Gilmore would from time to time. Handily enough, these EMGs don't have that typical strat hum. They have a really round tone that pops, and the expander knob is interesting because it boosts the high and bass, and I'm totally hooked on having a mid boost built into my guitar. It's so good. Like I've always said, listening to people's advice is good, especially mine. Sometimes the internet can get a little iffy, so at some point, you gotta trust your gut. And in this case, buy some EMGs! Oh hello, editing Danny here. I forgot to mention, if you want to know more about what David Gilmore uses, use the resource that I use to know 99% of the information that I used on this video, and that's gilmoreish.com. This is a bible of information of what David Gilmore has used over the years with Pink Floyd and his solo projects. It's amazing. As you may or may not know, I do have a Patreon. The link is below. I'm going to put a little essay together of all the pedals that I chose for my pedal board and why I chose those specific ones. So check that out. And while you're at it, do me a favor. Follow me on Instagram. If you want to have like updates of what's going on with the next video, Instagram is the home. Hit it. Everybody copies. If you aren't somehow affected by the concepts and emotions other creatives make you experience, you're either a sociopath or you're lying to yourself. What differentiates being a true creative and straight up plagiarism is courage. For the intro, I wanted to do an almost cover of the song Keep Talking by Pink Floyd using the same setup as David Gilmour. But recording it, I couldn't help but stray away and do my own thing. The people or bands that teeter too close to the edge of plagiarism, you know who I'm talking about. They don't have the confidence to just be themselves. Being creative is knowing what value you can add and then having the courage to truly express yourself. Put yourself out there. Then you gotta let your confidence guide you from there. It's like learning to read or write. You learn by reading words other people have put together, and as you get more comfortable, you learn how to put the words together yourself to tell your story. If you take concepts or ideas from a song you love or a guitar hero you admire, but you have the confidence to tell your story, you don't have to worry anything about copying plagiarism. It's gonna come out as your own. If you enjoyed this video or you learned something, do me a solid. Hit the little subscribe button there. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.